The next day is August 20th, the day that the MT town hall was supposed to happen. After the calls initially with all the other administrative officials before the president and the provost call, it kind of became clear that these town halls weren't going to be anything of substance or actual help for anyone. So the current students actually came up with the idea to create a virtual protest because um, it's Zoom, it's Zoom University at this point. And so we were like, great, let's do a virtual protest on Zoom. And the plan was for, um, we, we had developed a statement that the students were going to kind of put all in the Zoom chat. They were all gonna show up with the CR Truth logo as their profile picture. And um, we would come in, read the statement, that they were posting in the chat, and then we all would leave. And it would send a clear message that we are all together on this and we are united, and we are not backing down on what we know we need for change. So August 20th comes, we have this protest plan. We honestly are excited because it is a real moment. It is a real current student initiative and we are supporting them and they are feeling empowered. An hour before the town hall is supposed to happen. Beck Kirstein, the associate dean of Dyson, cancels the town hall completely and reschedules it for the following day, August 21st, at a completely different time window. It was very upsetting. The current students were upset, not only because they, they had their chance of making their voices heard and known taken away from them, but also because it was completely disrespectful to their time. You can't just take an entire group of, what, 80 plus students, say that they're all having to be at this one place at this one time, and then completely flip it to the next day, so not even time in advance, almost less than 24 hours, or almost a little over 24 hours, for a completely different time window, and say show up there. So we took the statement that we had developed with the current students that we were gonna read and post in the Zoom, and we kind of formalized it, put it into an email, and had all the current students sign it and send it into the administration as a response and say, we will not be attending this town hall. It was completely disrespectful for you to change it in this way. And here's what we would have said to you had you allowed it to happen. August 21st, they still hold the town hall. Um, only a few students showed up and ultimately nothing was really discussed and it became very clear that their plan of approach was really just going to be for them to talk and kind of disingenuously listen to student concerns that mind you had already been expressed in a full presentation on a call with the president and the provost so they disregarded again the student concerns and the student request not to have a town hall and to listen to what they were saying outside of the parameters of a town hall. They disregarded that and held it anyway. So now at this point, if it wasn't clear before, it's very clear that it's a lot of dodging, a lot of sidestepping, a lot of saying one thing and not actually following through, which of course is not surprising based on what we know about the experiences of Pace MT, but it was shocking to learn that the administrative officials actually followed the same kind of protocol and the same tactics. Um, it was very interesting. So we now are aware of that and we now know that, again, we have to re-strategize and kind of up the stakes. August 23rd, Pace administration calls a faculty meeting. And the reason we know about this faculty meeting is because we spoke to and it was told to us by a faculty member that was present in that meeting. When they told us about this meeting, their actual words to describe the meeting were, it was fucking disgusting. And obviously we were shocked to hear that and it became clear why. In this meeting, Pace administration essentially tells the faculty that they all have a job to do. And that job does not include talking about CR truth. They don't want CR Truths gaining any more traction than it already has, and basically tell them if they have any inkling of addressing it, not to do so. Also on this call, JV presents a list of emails and dates of times where he reached out to 
Dr. Santiago and Tiffany Hamilton, um, dating back to June 8th, they didn't respond on the call. They kind of just brushed him off. Um, so it was definitely shocking to hear that not only was the administration not understanding us, they were actively not trying to, and they were actively trying to suppress this movement, even down to telling faculty that they had a job to do and that it didn't include CR Truths. August 23rd, Tiffany Hamilton sends out an email to all of the current MT students saying that there was a misunderstanding about why the town hall was canceled between the faculty and the administration. And in this email, she provides a full list of um, actionable steps that they are taking to show that they're listening to the current students' concerns. One of which is that Amy has graciously consented to step away from her role to ensure a more harmonious start of the year. August 24th, school starts. August 25th, a faculty member who teaches a class around the business of acting um, for seniors has his first class with the senior, the, the seniors, the class of 2021. Um, in this class, the seniors share all of their concerns with everything that happened over the summer, the lack of response from the administration and faculty members, and they also express their concerns with being taught by Bob Klein. This faculty member hears them out, expresses their deep support for, for the senior class, and basically says, if you need anything or you need anyone, let me know, I am here for you. I will help you. That was at 10 a.m. August 25th. That same day on August 25th at 5.18 p.m., so only a few hours after that class happened, Alexander Tom, the now interim head of musical theater, emails the senior class and says that that faculty member that they had just had class with is, quote, stepping down from his instructional duties for the rest of the semester. August 25th, 7 p.m., I get on a call with Tiffany Hamilton to directly ask her what Amy stepping away means, both for the safety of the current students and just to better understand for our movement what was actually happening. So I get on the call with her and I ask her directly, what does Amy stepping away mean? She gives some avoidant sort of vague answers, the same kind of vague answers that she provided in the email uh, that she initially sent on August 23rd until she finally says that she doesn't know what stepping away means. This is the clip. So Amy is resigning or she's being fired? No, she, she stepped down from her role. So what we did was then Grant is leading PPA by himself. So she has no influence over how PPA is running. Um, I, I don't, I'll need to confirm whether or not she's teaching a course. I know that she's not teaching anything in musical theater. Um, so I can't say with certain, certainty what she's doing, but what I do know for certain is that she doesn't have um, influence on what we're doing with, with PPA moving forward. And so her, there's, you don't have any clarity about what her new position is yet? I don't know that she has a new role. I just know that she stepped down from being the ED, co-ED for, for PPA. I guess I'm just trying to understand then from, so is it because she has not specified what kind of role that she wants to take on moving forward? Or is it that you all haven't decided or communicated to her whether or not she needs to resign or, or, or her removal via firing her would be happening? So, so what I can share is what we decided was that we needed to focus on stabilizing PPA, which meant that we needed to start the search for the new ED ASAP with Grant in place for now and Amy stepping down from leadership within PPA and work with musical theater. I can follow up with Dean Grimes. I'm, let me see, I'm trying to look up now the last communication of the draft message that's going to go out. 
excuse me, to see what the, the language is, just because I know that that communication is forthcoming. And I don't want to overstep what Dean Grimes is doing, but I do want to be as transparent as my knowledge will allow. So basically, the personal personnel changes are underway. Um, and what they are going to announce, like we talked about in the town hall, is that there will be the associate dean out of the dean's office, Alexander Tom, and then uh, Betty uh, Kirstein, who will provide the support to MT, musical theater directly, and that the new hiring line for the musical theater department is being created so that we can start that search to get a permanent program head. And then um, the piece about the, the ED we're trying to, to work out how the announcement is going to come out with that search. Okay. I, and I know it sounds like I'm just a broken record, but I just, I think that people really want to know to what capacity Amy's involvement within the university is. Um, okay. Because as you know, our demand was to have her fired and her stepping away doesn't give clarity about if she's able to come back, if she is resigning, if she is stepping down into a, just a professor role, into a teacher position, a faculty position, not heading anything. So do you have any more clarity based on your knowledge to offer about that? I, I don't. So I will take, I will share this concern with, with, the group just so that as they're they are preparing the communication that they can disclose as much as they can once decisions are made um but yeah so i'll definitely get that information okay thank you the changes that we're asking for are not things that can be compromised on they are things that are absolutely necessary for pace and pace university to actually create the kind of change that it seems, at least I'm speaking to you directly, Tiffany, that you want to create, but this is part of that, that stuff that we talk about with radical change, that mm -hmm. radical change can't happen in systems that have already been established and have already been problematic because mm -hmm. then they don't, then they just swallow up any kind of change overall. And that's what they're designed to do. So we don't, we can't we can't compromise or reduce what we're asking for because what we're asking for is a complete overhaul of systems of oppression that this university, whether or not people are new or people are unaware, this university has upheld that oppression for 15 years. And that's based on the system and the processes that you all have followed up until this point, which is why something completely new has to be put into place and that completely new thing falls well outside of the bounds of the normal processes and policies that come up with things like this but that's where the that's where the opportunity to change is if you and your administration could come to us and say see our truth is going to lead this entirely and you have the university's support in in hiring and in um actual like structuring of curriculum and not just in a alumni being represented way and not just in a current student being represented way in a way where the power dynamic shifts it goes from the people up top in this small group of people who are in administrative positions and actually goes to the people that are receiving the education or have received the education got it i understand one last question yeah so, so if if that were to happen, is there room for university representation in that process? Absolutely. If I, well, I will take um, all that's been shared and uh, put it in a communication to the provost and Dean Grimes. Um, per, uh, everything that we talked about, and particularly uh, the communication going to the students with regards to the structure and kind of more better clarifying what's happening at the PPA level and the MT level. Um, I will share the information around the movement leading the search um, and, and we'll see what, what they say. Yeah. And um, you know, if, if you can, if you reach out via email or however, uh, I mean, 
I think email is best just for both of us to have, um, like just a concrete like traction of the, how the conversation has gone thus far. The urgency has to be present there. So as soon as I can get that response and also as soon as we can get more clarity about the actual definitive yes or no, is Amy removed or is she there? It will be better for the university to, to act with that sense of urgency. Sorry, is she removed or is she there? And got it. Okay. Um, I'm not sure who this follow up communication will come from, whether it's probably Dean Grimes, uh, but know that I will share everything with her and the provost. So I'm not sure who, because Dean Grimes is leading Dyson, and we really want her to be positioned to do that. Um, you may see the email from her. It may not come from me, but we'll see. All right. So that was concerning to me because this person is the chief diversity officer. She is the one who is providing most of the answers and clarification for what is happening with the current state of the school. So the person who gave the update, not knowing specifically what that update meant, was concerning to me. August 25th at 8.42 p.m., that faculty member emails the seniors himself and explains the reason for his resignation, briefly. So this was incredibly upsetting for the seniors because this faculty member not only is an important and vital part of their education that they were promised in PACE, but also a huge part of the industry. Um, they knew historically that this faculty member had been an incredible resource for every class prior to them. So the fact that he was stepping down and they didn't exactly know why was incredibly distressing. So I got on a call with them and we talked through what they were feeling and then I contacted this faculty member directly to get on a call. So on August 27th, I have a call with this faculty member and this is where he tells me why he resigned and also tells me about the faculty meeting on the 23rd and that's where he describes it as fucking disgusting, all that stuff. In this call, he tells me that after that class on August 25th at 10 a.m. with the seniors, he reached out to PACE administration about the concerns that the seniors brought to him and asked for resources on how to help them and how to show up for them as a point of support. Because obviously, now the whole summer has gone, they're in this kind of limbo, they don't know what's happening with their education, and they know that there's an uprising, which is obviously, you know, distressing. So he asked for resources. He receives no response from PACE administration on how to help these current students deal with this. He does a little more digging and essentially it becomes very clear to him that if he continues to ask these questions and seek these kinds of resources, he will become a target for the school. It's because of the fact that he comes into that awareness of being a target that he resigns out of fear of being retaliated against by the school. Later that day, on August 27th, I have a call with the seniors about Bob's class. They have Bob's class the next day, and they are incredibly distressed. They have a full list of harms that he has done to them prior to the semester even starting, and they don't know how to address it. Um, it's on that call that I essentially kind of give them the option that they want to choose whether or not they want to present it themselves or if they want to have CR Truths come in for protection's sake and also to kind of take that pressure of having to say those things directly to the person that harmed them and they choose for CR Truths to do it. Which brings us to August 28th, which is when we have the Zoom class. If you haven't seen it already, it's on our Instagram page it's a full breakdown of everything that happens on this day. 
Thank Hi, friend. You. We're going to have this conversation, and we're going to have it now. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, I know this is being recorded. Don't worry. It's fine. So after that conversation happened with the seniors and they decided to have CR Truths help them kind of facilitate this conversation, that was also the day that it really set in stone that CR Truths was also present as a means of protection and support for the current students as they were entering this year and going to have to be dealing with instances like this the entire year. It's cut short. And that same day, a prominent faculty member blocks Abdu and Cindy, two current seniors who are also featured on our page and have episodes. This faculty member blocking Abdu and Cindy is disturbing because this faculty member's specific role in all of this was to be the designated resource for current students to express their grievances to. That was what their job was. So blocking two students on social media in a sort of passive aggressive way to let them know you don't support them when you are also the person that is supposed to be their biggest support within the infrastructure of the school is completely unacceptable. Later that day on August 28th, we get a email to the CR Truths email from Alexander Tom the interim head who kind of interjected himself in a conversation that was going well. And he admits that he has seen, after reflecting, he sees that we were actually having a professional and productive conversation. And he basically admits that he came in with, with the wrong energy. He offers to talk. We don't take him up on that offer, mainly because at that point, with everything that had been demonstrated to us from the PACE administration and the way that he conducted himself, it was very clear that he was also not someone that was going to be necessary to talk to at this moment for what we needed. August 30th, PPA releases a statement that they are listening to the concerns of CR Truths and are holding a town hall to address them. So they say they are listening to the concerns of CR Truths while doing something that literally is the exact opposite of what we said and what the current students said they wanted. So the mixed messages there, the contradiction there is astounding. September 1st, the school creates an unpaid student advisory group called STARI, which stands for Students Taking Action Against Racial Inequity. That group is headed by the faculty member that blocked Abdu and Cindy. Just to further solidify that point, that this person was supposed to be the resource for students to take action against these things, to support student activism and was actively removing students from their feed to passive aggressively send the message that they didn't support them. Later that day, September 1st, the administration sends an email to the seniors saying that Richard Baskin will be stepping in to the role of teaching senior showcase class along with Bob. Um, in two sections. So the first section would be just Richard by himself, and then the second section would be Richard and Bob co-teaching. And in that email, they don't address the Zoom call, they don't address the history of harm that was presented on that Zoom call that Bob committed, they don't address that Bob has a history of harm, and they don't address any of the concerns that the students had, specifically that the students of color had brought up. Um, yeah, they don't address the fact that the students of color are, are saying that Bob is a harm to them and that they don't feel that he is properly equipped to teach at this moment in time. The next day, September 2nd, I have a conversation with JV, who is the, was the head of MT until he stepped down um, and Alexander Tom took over. 
And in that conversation, I ask him to align with this movement and to help us achieve the kind of change that we need and also to take accountability for the harm that he's caused over the years. He says he needs time to think about it and says that he'll get back to me. September 3rd is the protest that we had outside of Pace University. I wanna take this time again to thank every single person who showed up for this and every person who couldn't show up because of health concerns or just distance, but still supported us from afar. That day was incredible and it felt across the board. That energy was unlike anything that any of us had ever experienced. And it was only possible by the community that chose to stand up and stand together. So thank you for that. And if you haven't seen, we do have a video on our Instagram page of um, a kind of recap of the protest. So you can be there and not actually be there. After the protest later that day on September 3rd, Starry reaches out to SOT and asks to have a conversation. Basically, they say that they've been hearing stories um, from our Instagram page and they're following along and they really support it, but they're also getting stories from the faculty and the administration and they felt like they wanted a direct line to be able to hear the full course of events that have happened thus far. September 4th, the Pace administration holds a town hall. And the stipulations that they had set on this town hall were that the students were allowed to speak, but they had to send in their questions and concerns for essentially pre-approval and pre-screening. If their questions or statements or concerns were approved prior to the town hall, then they could speak about them by raising their hand on the Zoom and they were only allotted two minutes to talk about that question or concern. They attempted to have that town hall. Of course, we advised most of the students not to go and most of them didn't because they also understood that holding the town hall was a further insult to our request that we were making. September 7th, I have a meeting with Starry and in this meeting, I basically go through the entire rundown from 2015, 2016 till now. I describe the full list of events that I've described here to you up until this point and answer any questions that they have about anything that they've heard. In that conversation, they become kind of disturbingly aware of how actively the administration has been voiding certain parts of the story from them. So they, in that meeting, ask to form a more formal partnership with CR Truths so that we can help one another. They'll be on the ground furthering the kind of current student liaison for us, and we will be providing support externally and internally. September 9th, I meet with two diversity ambassadors, which is the branch of the Student Government Association, also known as SGA, um, that work under Tiffany Hamilton, the Chief Diversity Officer. I have a conversation with them basically to do what I did with Starry, which is inform them of all the events that have happened thus far and kind of get a gauge on where they are at and what they know. They didn't know most of what I was saying and they didn't know most of the events I was listing, which was concerning because the person that supervises them is Tiffany Hamilton, the Chief Diversity Officer. So, they didn't say this, but it was very clear that a, in a similar way to Starry, they were not being given the full truth of the situation in order to kind of curb or influence their perspective on the situation. Regardless of the fact that they didn't know that, they still voiced their support for CR Truths and agreed to help us in any way possible. September 11th, I have another conversation with JV on the phone and he request more time. I give a little bit more context as to what accountability will look like with us. I assure him that, that this process will be liberating for him and not an attack on him, and will also really, really primarily help the current students that he's harmed and the alumni that he's harmed. He says he needs more time. 
Later that day, September 11th, I have a call with the Student Government Association Pace Performing Arts representative, president, and vice president. Um, so essentially, they are a branch of SGA that deals specifically with Pace Performing Arts. And in that call, they start breaking down to me a list of a whole bunch of other issues that are going on in all the other majors within PPA, not just musical theater, that they had known about, but also became aware of through the issues that the musical theater program was going through. So just like with the Diversity Ambassadors and Starry, I give them a full timeline of the events that have happened between CR Truth and the administration thus far. And again, they didn't know most of it. They hadn't heard most of it from any of the administrative officials. And so they also showed their support for CR Truth and agreed to work with us more closely. September 11th to September 18th. CR Truths has a series of current student support calls, helping them deal with both what they're experiencing at the time and also what is coming up for them as more stories come out and as more conversation is had. So that whole week was pretty much dedicated to um, supporting them and helping them process what they were going through and what they were in. September 21st, Abdu is called into a meeting with the Dean of Students. And this call was to address potential policy violations that Abdu had committed. They were basically accusing them of recording the meeting with the Zoom call with Bob. And because it was posted publicly, it was in violation with university policy. When Abdu asks the Dean of Students to cite the actual policy within the handbook and tell them exactly what policy they broke, the Dean of Students spent 10 minutes fumbling on his computer, searching for this policy, and could not find it. Could not locate the policy that he was on the call to address. The Dean of Students closes out this meeting after not being able to find the policy, saying that there's no disciplinary action being taken at this time. But if another recording were to happen, that there would be potential actions against Abdu. Can I ask a question? Yeah. So like, can you just like point to me specifically where in the code of conduct or like in the specific IT sections, like I have it pulled up, I'm familiar with the student handbook where there's a discussion of recording Zooms and the school policies because from what I've reviewed, I haven't found any. I would love for you to show me or enlighten me on that situation, but to my knowledge, there's nothing that I have found. But also, um, back to your previous point real quick, I just want to mention that Alexander Tom, who's the head of the Pace Musical Theater Program, acknowledged that it was being recorded and on the recording said, that's totally okay. So, yeah, as far as that goes, that's just another thing to that I was taking into consideration. So the, I was not aware of that. That was not shared with me. Um, it's on the recording. I mean, if you've if you've watched it, um, if not, I would suggest that you do. So maybe we can have a conversation about the content. But um, do you know where? Um, I believe you. Do you know where in the recording that was? Like at what? At like what time interval? Or uh, I could find it for you. But Alexander Tom comes in within the last three to five minutes and it's very quick. Okay, okay, let me, let me check on that too. You're looking at the IT policy right now? Yes. Okay, let me find it here. Here and I can't remember if it's in here or the um, code of conduct. 
I would, can I just ask you, can I just ask that I would love if before these meetings happen in the future, these things are looked up previous coming in so that my email isn't barraged with a bunch of emails from y'all that stress me out because you're the dean of students and you're in charge of discipline at this school. Um, and then you're coming in here without even having the information necessary. Like you didn't even watch the video that you're discussing right now, clearly. I watched, I watched most of it. I watched most of it. But I'm, I would ask you to watch all of it and I would ask you to, in the future, engage this conversation with the information that's necessary so that you don't stress students out and yeah, there's just, clearly there's a lot of things that you were not aware of that I would hope that someone would be aware of before they reached out discussing future disciplinary action on something. Wait, so as far as the code of conduct policy goes, did you ever find what policy you were referencing? September 22nd, Cindy is called into a meeting with the Dean of Students. The exact same reasoning, only this time when Cindy asks the Dean of Students to cite the policy, the Dean of Students pulls up the policy right away. Interestingly enough, it's the very last policy listed in the handbook. It was interesting. It was interesting to say the least because if it was hard to find, you think it would be readily available there. If, you, if it was at the very end, if you were scrolling through, you would see it at the very end. But the Dean of Students cites the policy violation and says that no disciplinary action is being taken at this time, but if another recording were to happen, that there would be potential actions against Cindy. Both of these meetings, it's important to note, uh, Abdu and Cindy communicate to the Dean of Students that recording Bob's class specifically is a very common practice. It's a thing. It's called Fridays with Bob's. It's posted on it's posted on Instagram. People post it on their stories, and there's never been any sort of retaliatory mention or disciplinary action being threatened before. So it seemed very clear that the reason that these two were being called in is because the administration had deemed them as the kind of central point of CR Truths, and they wanted to make it clear to them that if they were gonna to continue to expose the truth of the institution in this way, that there would be actions taken against them. Later that day, September 22nd, I text JV because I still haven't heard from him and ask him where he's at with aligning in the process. He says that he needs more time. He says that he'll get back to me by the end of the week. He never reaches out. He doesn't get back to me. And in this final effort to ask him to align with this movement, I say to him in the text that this movement is built on an open door policy, meaning that we don't ever close the door to someone because they've said no too many times or they've caused too much harm. That doesn't exist. In, as far as CR Truth is concerned. Anyone can align with this movement and anyone can join the healing process, the reparative process that this movement is creating at any point. That is a solid policy of this movement. And I wanted to communicate that to him so that 
He knew that. While it was disappointing that he wasn't taking the opportunity right then, after so much time had passed and so many chances had been given to him, that it was still possible. And that if he wasn't going to take it now, that the door was always open. September 25th. We gain information that a past faculty member and a past administrative official had actually contacted the deans, Tiffany Hamilton, and any other administrative official about the issues that happened in the Island of Misfit Toys, as well as the issues that they've known about with Amy prior. They had contacted them and asked them and made a request of all of these administrative officials to do something about it. These administrative officials sent no response back, offered no help to this person trying to seek some kind of resolution for these issues, and went full force forward with Amy's promotion. So not only did they know and had been contacted by JV, but they had been contacted by someone else who was a prominent figure within Pace Performing Arts and chose to ignore it. September 26, I still haven't heard from JV, and it's two days past the time that he said he would reach out. So I text him again and again ask where he's at with aligning with the movement. He responds to me finally with an answer and says that while aligning with the movement in the long term isn't out of the question, that currently he has some conditions that he wants met in order to do this. This was incredibly disheartening because at this point, a total of around three hours of conversation has been had with this person, not to mention the history between this person and the current students, alumni, about what aligning with this movement means and what taking accountability actually looks like. So when he responded with conditions, it became very clear that this wasn't going to be a, a point of authentic accountability. So we don't respond right away. We deliberate as a team, and basically I reach out after that point and say this to him and say, authentic accountability cannot come from a place of self-interest. It only can come from the place of wanting to repair the harm that you have caused. And if it doesn't come from that place, we can't go through this process in a genuine, authentic way, which we want to with him. Um, so at the end of that text, I ask him again, now knowing all of this and knowing where your interests must lie and what the intention of authentic accountability needs to be, will you align with us? Mind you, I'm noting to him that it's a conversation. It's not like a fixed thing that will happen because authentic accountability isn't that. It is a process, it is a flow. Um, but that I wanted him to make the commitment, base, baseline, just make a commitment to aligning with this movement and committing to authentic accountability. He didn't respond and has yet to respond.